principles are universal. Some are more focused on technology. Okay, um, there's a little bit about me. You know, my name's Trisha Cornelius, in case you didn't catch that. I didn't realize that I was from the, dealt with the pelican brew eve. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram as Trisha Webbs, and you can read my musings about life, the universe, and everything else on blog.trishacornelius.coza. Okay, now when we're talking with something like this, it helps if we speak the same language. Um, I am going to make all of these slides available on my blog, and I'll send them to the organizers as well, so I don't know if they're going to be on the WordCamp Cape Town blog, but please don't worry about trying to make notes about this because there is a lot of content in this show. Okay, firstly, diversity. It refers to having a variety of people in your group with different characteristics. And your most obvious ones are things like sex, race, gender, but they can also be really, really simple. So for example, in this room, we've got some folks who wear glasses and some who don't. That's a diversity marker, okay? Inclusion, this refers to how people feel. You, can't, you don't get to decree that you have an inclusive environment. It's how people feel in the space. Okay, and I love this particular quote which is inclusion is not about a person changing to fit in, but rather about the environment shifting to accommodate those things that make each people unique. So ideally, if you wanna have an inclusive environment, you shift and you make space for the changing environment. Okay, intersectionality. This refers to the interconnected nature of social characteristics such as race, class, gender, it can, and things like that, as they apply to either a given individual or a group regarded as creating interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantages. So for example, a black person from Kailicha has the simultaneous intersectionality of being in a less advantaged race, a less privileged race, and also being impoverished. A black lady from Kailicha will have a different challenge to a black man from Kailicha, but there will be intersectionalization. So marginalization refers to how you treat people. So it's the treatment of a person, a group, or concept as insignificant or peripheral. Now, microaggressions are subtle but offensive comments or actions that are, directed, that are traditionally directed at a minority or other non-dominant group that, is often, that are often unintentional or unconsciously reinforce a stereotype. South Africa has a bit of a unique thing in that it's not so much our minority that get, is the subject to, to um, that suddenly got dark in here, um, that are subject to microaggressions, but it is the traditionally disempowered people in the country. So for example, because we have had systematic barriers placed in the country, there's a level of microaggressions that are directed. Okay, now this is a word that causes a lot of heckles to be raised. So let's define it. Privilege. It refers to the interconnected nature of social categorization such as race, class, and gender as they apply to a given individual or group regarding as cre regarded as creating, overlapping, and interdependent oh, systems of advantage. Sorry, I've got the wrong definition here. I'll fix that before I put it in. Okay, but let's also look at what privilege is not. It's not saying that you haven't had a hard life, but it's saying that the area in which you are privileged is not one of the things that have made your life harder. And the other thing is, it's not an indictment on your character. It's not, uh, it's not saying you horrible, horrible person. Oh, I think that I stood on some things. 
Um, it's not saying, oh, wow, you are white and therefore you are bad. It's just saying this ha you have this characteristic and that has given you an advantage. Okay. Now, structural barriers are an issue that is beyond one's personal control, that is part of the context or environment that is related to belonging to a particular group. So being in a rural area, being in a situation of poverty, um, things like that. Now, why should we even talk about these things? Okay, number one, the, this isn't a uniquely South African problem, okay? It's very much global. Now, also, we're not good at seeing what's in our periphery. And if you don't know about something, you're not going to act on it. There's a really cool video on YouTube that you can watch about the invisible, what they call the invisible gorilla. And it's a social experiment that they did, which was specifically to see how people responded to things on their periphery. And they went, OK, here we've got a group of, they had a group of people, some in uh, black clothes, some in white clothes, and went, OK, your job is to count how many times the white people in the white clothes pass the ba basketball. And it turned out that it was 15 times. And then they would go, oh, by the way, what did you think of the man in the gorilla suit? And the participants would go, what? And in the middle of the, of the experiment, because the people were busy focusing on the basketball being passed, they did not see the man in a gorilla costume walk across the stage and go, oh, look at me, and do the stereotypical beating of that. Okay, now, South Africa has an advantage. We are good at acknowledging and having these difficult conversations. And here, the works of Brene Brown are really useful. She talks about a concept in social work of leaning into the discomfort. Our challenge, however, is to not just talk, but then to act. Okay, and all of these topics come with baggage. All of us have baggage about them. And when you talk about them, you have to kind of in front, confront your baggage. Okay. Now, this is what diversity and inclusion is about. It's a big world. There is room for everyone. Okay. Now, you want to increase your skill pool. There are, unfortunately, there isn't data readily available for South Africa. But in 2017, there was an estimate that in 2020 in the United States, there will be 1 million unfold coding positions due to a lack of, uh, of education, which is good for the devs in the room, except maybe not because they knew it's so overworked and underemployed. Okay. Now, the other reason why you want to care about this is money. So who here has not sent or received a please call me? Yep. Do you know why that came out? There was a black gentleman at Vodacom, and he kept having a fight with his girlfriend. And they were going, what? And he was like, I can't call you. I don't have airtime. And she's like, nonsense. And so as a result of that, he came up with a please call me. If he didn't have those structural barriers and that context, we would be on an entirely different plane and there would not be no please call me's. Okay. The other reason why you should care is in South Africa, it's actually a legal requirement. If you want to chat to me afterwards about the legal implications of will, um, you will consume, but I'm not going to go into them any more than this. But South Africa is a pretty unique constitution in that generally your constitutions are regarded as vertical. They govern the relationship between the state and individuals. South Africa's constitution has both vertical application and horizontal. And what that means is that depending on certain things like the nature of the right, you have a legal obligation to um, make sure that that right is fulfilled. And one of your rights is your rights to equality. So I'm just going to quickly quote, which says here, 
You may not unfairly discriminate directly or indirectly against anyone on any more or any one or more of the grounds, including race, gender, sex, pregnancy, marital status, ethnic or social origin, color, sexual orientation, age, disability, religion, conscious belief, culture, language, and birth. And so that's where we actually have a legal obligation to care as well. Okay, now quite often people go, oh, we don't read, this doesn't matter. So this is a pretty typical quote. You like diversity when it's about stuff that shouldn't matter. Gender, skin color, sexual preferences, but less so when it affects something that should. And unfortunately, that's a very common attitude. And ideally, in an ideal world, it shouldn't matter. But in the real world, it does. And if you speak to any person who's in any form of less powerful group, they will probably have stories to tell you. So um, if you have a conversation, one of the most common ones now are the Me Too stories, which are about power and sexual relations. But there's also stories of racism and things like that. And here, quite often, people go, oh, come on, it's not that bad. So here, I'm going to quote some things. We've got a bonus definition, which is gaslighting, which is basically a form of psychological manipulation, which says, oh, you can't trust your own mind. It didn't happen that way. OK, and this is a really good illustration here. And the, the lady who has subsequently, subsequently left tech and came back and is now very happily employed by Automatic, which, well done, is, says where she went, being called a C was far less damaging than everything else because I knew that was inappropriate. Everything else was much easier to internalize. I thought a lot about leaving because how do you not think about leaving when some dude bullies you for a year and then calls you a C, and nothing happens. And oh yeah, he still works there, even now. And when HR used the fact that you were sexually assaulted to gaslight you. So that's one of the examples. Another one from, these are examples that I didn't look hard for, by the way. Um, Netflix earlier this year, they had a meeting in which the mark chief marketing referred to certain employees as a six-letter word beginning with N. And in context, Netflix has a reputation for firing swiftly and brutally. Generally, if you mess up today, gone tomorrow. But uh, Jonathan Friedman, who was his second offense in that, was uh, he used the word in a meeting in February 2018 and was only let go in June 2018. Now, this, I, I resonate very strongly with Karen Willrund because she is also someone who started out in law and took a different path. So she was the lead counsel for a million dollar software company and she was asked to be in a meeting because of her expertise with software and other technology. She walks in, to the meeting room and there are two men already having a cup of, co cup of coffee and uh, two men having a conversation and one of them sees her and says, hey honey, could you get us some coffee? Thanks. And then a bonus example is at one of the JC listed companies in Sanson, a lady dev was asked, hey, thanks for being here. Please go make us the tea and coffee. So these things happen. Now, how do you change these? You make sure that you have a clear statement of your vision of what you want your organization to want to, want and your values. Okay, so your transformation vision is a statement of what the, the ideal environment in a space will look like. So, for example, if your space has 
100 seats. Who are those seats taken up by? How do people, there. And this is not how it is, it's how you want it to be. This is what you are working towards. So with things like this, you will obviously look at the demographics of the country, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, now your values are the things that you actually do. And this is how you behave. And so if you can say your values are things that are mentioned, for example, in your code of conduct, like um, being non-discriminatory, welcoming regardless of race, gender, economic class, um, intellectual capabilities, things like that. Now, one of the things that people will say is, oh, should there be additional spaces for people who are in a less powerful group? And these, the general consensus is yes, there should be, but they should not be a replacement. So it shouldn't be, here's WordCamp, and here's WordCamp for women. And the two should, should never overlap. It should be, oh, and here's a space where women in WordPress can get together and have a conversation about specific things that went down. The reason why you want to have that is because it gives places for people of a similar background to discuss their experiences. And it's very difficult to, in the same space, have a place where people can educate and go, you know, the comments of where you called me a guy. See, not so cool, but, you know, this is why you should do better next time. Um, and at the same time go, won't believe it, it happened again. So that's where you do this. Okay. Now, the importance of leadership. And here, I'm going to refer to Seth Biden's point that not, not everyone in a position of power is a leader, and you don't need to be in a position of power to lead. So this is where the leadership we're talking about here. Okay. Now, group identity refers to how we, our group refers to itself. So for example, here, if we go, oh, these are all people of Word, WordPress, and specifically the ones who attend WordPress. Okay, now a group's identity is built by its actions. And this is both a positive and a negative. So if you've got harmful uh, behavior from one member of the group, it hurts the entire group. And helpful behavior from one member of the group can boost that group. And a lot of people go, oh, we don't need need external oversight or things like that because we self-police. And so the reason why I've got that term there is so it says this is what an organization, an organization does not just incorporate to any group. So for example, frame a circle of three people, you do have a group identity and a level of organization. But here, so it's responsible for its own compliance to legal, safety, and ethical standards. And if someone in the group misbehaves and you don't, you need to go, am I personally in this group happy for that to be responsible, to be associated with that? And if your answer is no, personally, I don't want to be responsive, like, associated with that, Acts against it. Okay, cool. This is difficult work. Systematic barriers have been put in place for years. Power structures exist for years. You are not, it's not your fault that the power structures and the barriers exist. But we are responsible to how we respond to those actions. Okay. And people are both very simple and very complex. And so we just need people to help us feel safe 
And they, you also need people to modif modify the behavior. Okay. Now, this is one of the things that you can, you must remember when it comes to creating a space. People are watching you. So this is what um, Miss Nevote was referring to, where she was saying that when it becomes a one-star review, it's people aren't, you're no longer interacting directly with the person who your interaction is with. People are saying, how do you handle this? Okay, people are looking. How do you interact with newcomers? Are newcomers welcome in? How do you interact with people when there's an agreement? How do you interact when there's a power differential? And this goes to intersectionality and complexities and things like that. How do you handle it when there's a violation of boundaries? So, for example, we've got some very good things. Is that my five-minute warning? Okay, well, I'm going to leave this up. <laughs> so, um, right, going over time. Does that include um, the extra time that I was getting because we went to the mic? Okay, cool. <laughs> no, I'm just asking. Okay. So, the paradox of tolerance is, says, oh, but surely we can't kick people out because they've got a different opinion. And actually, the answer is you can. If someone is using racist, sexist, homophobic, or other downright offensive language or behavior, you absolutely can kick them out, and furthermore, you should, because there's something called the paradox of tolerance, which basically says if a society tolerates intolerance, the tolerant will be driven out, and you will only let, be left with the intolerant folks. Okay. Um, so things that you can do to make people feel welcome. As mentioned, people want to feel safe and included. Have your rules. Be explicit about what's allowed, and make sure that it's enforced for everyone. And this is really challenging, because people have got into leadership roles and positions of power in a community because they are valuable to the community. So this is where you need to go. The good of the community means that sometimes we need to take a little bit of a hit. Okay? Then you can assume report violations are of code of conduct and things like that are true. Investigate. There are false reports. Make sure that you do get the other side of the story. But remember that false reports are rare. And investigate claims thoroughly. Okay? Watch out for boundary pushing if there are generally two reasons why boundary pushings happen. One, people are a bit clueless and don't mean to, and if they get called out on it, they'll change their behavior. Or these are the ones that you need to watch out for, the people who enjoy pushing the boundaries of others and get that. Okay, make sure that you can replace everyone. Okay, and this is where sometimes people go, oh, we don't have a hierarchy and that's why there can't be harassment. There's a problem with that because people do deviate to hierarchies as a, gravitate to hierarchies as a rule, which is why you want to have an explicit hierarchy and have a process for position, for people to complain about the people who are in positions of power and have a process to deal with that. Okay, um, the reason we want to have policies and procedures is so that you know what you want to do with a situation before it arises, so you're not on the back foot. And also, you just want to be flexible with your procedures, because quite often, when there's a violation, people won't necessarily report directly to the person in power. They'll report to someone they feel safe, and they'll listen from there, we'll take it from there. Okay, now, one of the things that you often hear is be an ally. And the reason that allies are, so, allies are so important is because it's easier for an ally to act because they don't face the same repercussions as a marginalized person for speaking up. So, your privilege can be used for good. And here, we've got an example in this room. Dane is wonderful in terms of sharing his knowledge and expertise. So, he'll share his skills and networks very nicely. Um, other people will go, oh, you should speak to so-and-so, things like that, amplify your other voices, okay? There's a difference between being a bystander to an event and witnessing it. A, a witness will 
acknowledge and validate the other person's experience. Yes, that thing happened, it was inappropriate and you're not overreacting. And what should you do when it happens? Call out the bad behavior. So this is where you go, this thing that you did was wrong. So you don't say you are a misogynist when someone says so-and-so was a C. You say it was completely wrong for you to call so-and-so a C. It's not acceptable. Don't do it again. It doesn't open the argument where they can go, oh, I'm not a misogynist because of I've got a wife and a mother. Okay. Now, when you in a situation where you see the harmless, note the inverted commas, racism or sexism or whatever. How do you respond? Practice your simple responses. Go, oh, awkward, not cool. Be simple, keep short. Don't try and make a joke of it. Play to your audience. So go, look at how it is in the room. And sometimes you're not necessarily educating and calling out the person who had affected, who, who, who committed the violation, but to everyone else in the room, and also going, look, we don't accept this in our space. Now, this is one where you need to pay attention to the dynamic, because sometimes it's more powerful, and you need to read the room, and you need to go, actually, as Sammy said. Other times, you need to go, not cool and not amplified. Speak for yourself. Say, I do not want to be associated by this racist conduct. Pick your battles. Sometimes you're just too tired and don't have the energy, and that's okay. You don't get a naughty badge for being a good person. So please don't expect praise and credit for fighting inequality. And if you make a mistake, apologize, correct yourself, and move on. Please, my call to action here, if you do only one thing, be a person that makes others and welcome in your space. And when you do get it wrong, because we all do, remember that your impact is And don't say things like, but you must understand it wasn't meant like that. You are taking this too seriously. You are blowing this out of proportion. The injured person is the person who gets to decide what the impact was. So if I, you've broken my toe, it doesn't matter if it was an accident or not. I still have a broken toe. So your intentions are irrelevant when it comes to impact, but intentions do matter. So if you deliberately trod on my foot, I'm going to respond differently to you accidentally tripping and standing on my toe. Okay. It doesn't matter how you mess up, it matters how you fix it. So apologize, learn from it, and do better next time. And this is actually really a really useful guide on how to apologize. Take responsibility, go, I'm sorry that this happened. This is not a programming loop, there is no conditions. There's no ifs, there's no buts. Make amends. If there's something that you can do to mend the situation, do it. And remember, the best apology is a change in behavior. Okay, cool. So that's the end of the talk. Thank you so much. And so there's some resources. Cool, that's unexpected. Um, one of the things that I can't recommend highly enough is a book by Nene Malefi, who is a South African diversity and inclusion advocate and has a huge amount of experience. She's got a book called A Journey of Diversity and Inclusion in South Africa. And it's 245 Rand for the ebook. You can get the ebook or you can get the physical copy. You can have a talk to me, I can show you the book. Um, as I said, there will be, I'll make these slides available. There's a video called Anti Oppression 101, which is just going back to the basis and reminding. A lot of these concepts that I covered and things that you can do is a blog post called No More Rockstars. And then even the ADA initiative has closed down. It still has an active website, and it's got a encyclopedia of conflict policies and incidents and things that can be handled and things like that. Because the tr truth is, we now in an unchartered territory. So this is where we need 
leaders with a bit of grace and humor. So thank you so much. And let's try not to be stereotypes with this. Thanks so much.